Warhammer 40k Darktide is right around the corner. And with the beta behind us, I can say with some confidence the game's got potential to be one of the biggest hits of the next 12 months. The gameplay is addictive, the action satisfying, but can the developers win fans over with some new ideas, a streamlined approach to classes, and changes that may leave some scratching their head? Hey there friends, it's Kodiak here, welcome to Legacy Gaming. Today, we're sharing our brutally honest impressions for Warhammer 40k Darktide after 25 hours of play. Warhammer fans across the world have been anxiously awaiting the arrival of Darktide. The game, unlike its predecessor, Vermintide 2, takes place in the 40k universe. Dark and gritty hive cities are the new backdrop to the carnage, and while it's not quite as vibrant as the fantasy world of Warhammer, it's hard to deny the game's more serious presentation. However, what is familiar is the complete and utter chaos of combat, the destruction of flesh and bone, and the pure joy that comes with shooting through or hacking apart your enemies. Now keep in mind that our experience, and everyone that played during the closed beta, only got access to a small portion of the game. It's exciting though, for the first time all four characters were playable. Players had access to the veteran sharpshooter, the zealot preacher, the ogren skullbreaker, and the psyker psychonetic. Players also had access to eight different weapons and four different missions, each of which really set the stage for the overall experience within Darktide. The team also opened up the Morningstar, the game's hub, which included some of the various vendors and interactables that will be present at launch. Finally, the team revealed a variety of important character progression systems, something we at Legacy Gaming have been desperate to learn more about. All of this is to say there's a decent amount to talk about, and while we did only get a small amount of time with the game, we made the most of every second of that experience. If you're coming over from Vermintide 2, then you've most likely had one question on your mind. What classes will be available to play in Darktide? At launch, the team has said that only four subclasses, one for each archetype, will be available. Let's not mince words here. This is a big issue, one the developers are going to need to reconcile with. Players coming over from Vermintide 2 are going to expect more variety in their game, especially after the robust career section that accompanied that experience. New players that pick up Dark Tide having really no idea what it is are going to find the class variety limiting, and that's just the truth. Four classes in 2022 just isn't enough, and while Fat Shark, the developers, can say that individual progression through skills and guns is more important, from what we've seen, the team just isn't doing anything groundbreaking, and let's be crystal clear here, that could be a big problem. In my mind, the solution is pretty simple. Communicate early and often about what's coming down the pike. It doesn't need to be a roadmap, I think gamers have gotten obsessive over that concept in the last few years, but it needs to be communicated that there's a plan for expansion. Right now, all we know is that one class could be coming each quarter, and that's just not going to cut it. Sure, you'll get players back to Darktide every couple of months with some new content, but is that really a winning strategy, or just simply a way to spike player counts every couple of months? It's hard to say. Now, I don't want to distract too much from the classes themselves. We've known for a while the basic functions of each of the archetypes, but what we really got to experience for the very first time were some of the underlying systems that made each operative unique. For example, the veteran sharpshooter has two iconic traits, one that increases damage by 15% when hitting weak spots, and the other which increases ammo reserves for all ranged weapons by 75%. These are things we might have got a taste of in one of the developer blogs, but nothing we had concrete data around. We also got a much better understanding of the importance of teamwork and how coherency and auras really play into your success and survival. Each player brings something different to the table and strengthens some aspect of your team through their aura. It's a lot of passive effects, not exactly the most engaging mechanism, but it all leans into the idea of playing as a team, a driving factor for the devs. What I'll be perfectly blunt about is the simplicity of it all. At this point, the team really hasn't shown an appetite for taking risks. Archetypes and subclasses all feel very foundational, but given the drastic shift in setting and more of an emphasis on ranged combat, it makes sense, to me at least, to really build a strong base before trying to expand into new and fantastical ideas. That is, if the team expands at all, which as I already pointed out, I think they will. 
The one exception to the rule is really the Psyker, which the team has kept incredibly under wraps until this point, probably because it's the most interesting of the four character classes in the game. The Psyker uses mental attacks to assault enemies, but as they do that, a special resource called Peril increases. You reach 100 Peril, you die. If you learn to master the art of popping heads and killing enemies, you reap the benefits through the class's iconic buff, which adds a layer of depth to the Psyker the other classes simply don't have. Who are we kidding? It's a variation of a magic class, but it's so rooted in the 40k experience that it feels incredibly unique. The Ogryn also feels properly sturdy and has believable weight behind all of his movements and attacks. It's a pretty cool sight to see a horde of enemies bearing down on you, only for your Ogryn buddy to come charging past you, knocking everything down. He even has this insane little grenade box that absolutely chunks elite enemies in the perfect, big dumb fashion that Ogryns are known for. The other classes aren't bad. Don't take this to mean we don't like them. They're just a little more vanilla than the Psyker and the Ogryn, and that's fine. Like I said, I think it's clear the team is building a strong foundation from which to build on. With our characters selected, we got the chance to explore the Morningstar, something the team had previously shown off in a closed alpha, but never quite like this. It's an incredible hub, one the team has already said they plan to make more social than in previous games. It's bigger, more open, and feels like a place to hang out with fellow players ahead of a mission. While not quite as homey and charming as the Vermintide 2 hub, it definitely fits the bill and instantly won me over as a place I was okay hanging out in. The Morningstar was also expanded to house some of the vendors that will be available at launch, including a weapons vendor as well as a contracts vendor, something we'll talk about in a future video. Long story short, the Morningstar feels like a great place to kick off your adventures in Darktide, and the more players that join the hub, the better the experience got. I can already envision the Morningstar on launch day, and it's something I think a lot of players will enjoy. Before we get into the gameplay proper, we have to talk about some UI stuff, mainly the mission board. Good God, I love the mission board. The team has been teasing this since the beginning, and they delivered. They clearly were tweaking behind the scenes because from alpha to beta, this thing is night and day. For those that don't know, when you activate the mission board, you'll see a number of different missions pop up, each with a different threat level indicated overhead. Missions are constantly cycling in and out, bringing about new opportunities and challenges. I love everything about this system from the look and feel to the actual function. The team needed a way to create enough buckets that would entice players without going overboard, creating too many segmentations resulting in long matchmaking queues, and honestly, I think they hit the mark. When in doubt, there's always the option for quick play, and while I'm not entirely sold on this from an endgame perspective, I like what I see and I applaud the team for really taking the time to nail this system. Okay, with our characters chosen and a mission picked out, it was time to jump into the action, and for me, this felt immediately familiar. Within minutes, hordes of enemies were rushing our group, and while things certainly look different, when you break it down to its most basic level, the experience was intimately familiar. As someone that wanted to push the boundaries of the game's new or readjusted systems, I spent a lot of time staying at range, testing out those capabilities. The gunplay feels authentic to the brand and definitely beefy. Not surprising, given some of the more bombastic weapons from Vermintide 2, but because the emphasis was so much more focused on ranged combat, I felt the experience left a little to be desired. I think, and don't quote me on this, it was because we were limited to a certain subset of weapons for each character. That shouldn't be the case if Fat Shark's last game is any indication, but after about the sixth or seventh mission, using the same old LAS gun just didn't quite have the same impact. We've heard that there will be at least 70 weapons at launch, which should, in theory, amplify the combat experience. Overall, though, it's not a bad combat experience, but it's also not groundbreaking, and that's okay. The hack and slash combat is as good as ever, and the 40k weaponry really taps into the imagination of it all. There's nothing better than hacking away limbs with a trenching shovel or a big old meaty salvage club, and the slight enhancements to the overall system keeps it a relevant part of the experience. It's clear the team really wanted to nail the balance, and that's apparent at every turn. The Ogryn and Zealot are built as frontline melee-focused characters, while the Veteran and Psyker are a bit more effective behind that wall of protection. Still, it's important to point out that every class is capable of both melee and ranged combat, and that's the beauty of the formula. It's meant to be a seamless dance between ranged and melee, and overall, it feels good. Just like with Vermintide 2, the best thing about Darktide is the team play, and it's actually a bit funny how often the game tries to disrupt that single aspect of the game. Unlike the slightly more open worlds of Vermintide 2, 
Darktide's levels are often dense, multi-layered, and filled with a million different side rooms and passageways. It is ridiculously easy to get separated from your team, and that can often be an issue when you least expect it. Fatshark knew what they were doing when they decided to double down on coherency. If you wander off, you're going to feel the effects of that. It's apparent in practically every aspect of the gameplay experience, and if I'm being honest, it's the best part of the experience. Cutting down waves of enemies with your friends on Discord is just a blast, and part of the charm of the series. Sadly, that charm doesn't permeate into everything. In fact, one aspect of the game that really disappointed me was actually the enemies themselves. They're grotesque, challenging, sometimes downright brutal, but they don't have the same appeal as some of the special enemies from Vermintide 2. When a special or elite enemy enters the field in Darktide, it often gets a bit lost within the world. Maybe it's the overall aesthetic being a bit darker, the enemies all kind of pulling from the same theme, but the experience isn't quite the same. Now don't get me wrong, things like Crushers, Bulwarks, and Plague Ogrins, just to name a few, can absolutely ruin your day. But I'd even go so far as to say it's a step in a more serious, less fun direction, but it certainly nails the Warhammer 40k look to a T. Now I'll reserve final judgment for our worth your time review, but it's something I definitely have my eye on. Another thing I was definitely keyed in on was the overall user experience, specifically around the menus. Fat Shark menus all kind of look and feel the same from game to game in their function, but I guess I was just hoping for a little more polish in Dark Tide. Maybe it's an homage to another age, but quite frankly, the interface feels like something out of the Duke Nukem or Wolfenstein era. It's a bit clunky, doesn't have that snap, crackle, and pop we've come to expect from modern UIs, but does it completely distract from the experience? No, it doesn't. The same could be said for the in-game UI. Just like in Vermintide, nothing is really explained to you, so you really have to figure it out for yourself. Small things like the coherency buff or an item next to a teammate's name aren't ever explained, and that may be a bit of a barrier for some more casual players. It's not a huge obstruction, but still, it's a barrier, and that's never good when you consider how more casual players might experience a game. There's a lot of good going on with Dark Tide. Some room for improvement, sure, but the meat is there. During our time with the beta, Dark Tide managed to keep us locked in for hours on end. When we weren't playing the game, we wanted to be playing the game, and that's often the sign that things are heading in the right direction. I can say with confidence that Dark Tide has already left a lasting impression on our team. The stage is set for an incredible Warhammer 40k game. It's all there. The developers just need to not muck it up by failing to communicate or release content at a steady clip, which I think they'll be able to do looking at their track record. The characters are interesting, and the ability to customize the look, feel, and backstory is a great change of pace that will add to a lot of players' overall immersion and connection with the game. But the lack of class variety so far is something that concerns us. The gameplay itself, what's there to say? It's rock solid, as I expected it would be. There are a few bumps and blips that I pointed out, and some others that detract from the overall experience, like some weird issues with bots getting stuck. But if you love slashing and shooting your way through a seemingly endless supply of enemies, then you'll absolutely get your fill. Finally, I have to talk replay value. It's incredibly high, and as long as the team continues to engage their community with new content, I can easily see this game being the most successful entry into a series that already has a massive following. The 40k setting is one fans have been waiting for, and the team is setting up the experience to be another wild, crazy ride. So there you have it, our brutally honest impressions of Warhammer 40k Dark Tide. Remember, this is not our full review of the game, that comes later once we go hands-on with the full release version. But we hope this snapshot of our experience helped you understand a bit more about the world Fat Shark is creating. If you found this video helpful or enjoyable, do me a solid, hit that thumbs up, and consider subscribing. It's still the single best way to help channels like ours reach new audiences. I'm also excited to announce that Legacy Gaming has merch. We heard you guys loud and clear. You wanted to rock the blue and white, and now you can. Head on over to our website, legacygaming.gg shop to check out brand new custom designs. We've got shirts, hoodies, and a hat, but rest assured, more designs will be coming very soon. My name is Kodiak, and from everyone here at Legacy Gaming, thanks for watching, and play on.